Hi, hi everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk. My name is Dmitry and I create software that works in, in, in some cases. Over the last few years, I'm working in the field of API testing. I build tools that aim to make it a simple and effective process. For example, I implemented one of the most performant JSON schema validators in Rust and created Schema Tesis, a project that automates API testing with a single command. Also, I contributed to popular packages like Hypothesis and Django Mining. Today, we are going to talk about effective API testing. And let's start from the opposite. What happens if it's ineffective? First of all, logical errors. For example, if you had bad uh, input requirements, then, for example, the user can top up for a negative amount of money. Then outdated API docs can be a huge source of confusion. Teams working on the project are out of sync and it becomes harder to grasp what's going on. Security issues are also possible. Uh, last year's research from Microsoft shows that at least four security properties should, um, should be in place. But of course, uh, there are much more of them. For example, if your input validation doesn't work well, it's possible to create some payload that will slow your application down and eventually it may lead to denial of service. And of course, unexpected inputs might lead to crashes. Besides all of these issues, we have a lot of time wasted, higher cognitive load and potentially even financial losses. But how did we get here? Uh, modern systems are complex and to test them, well, we need to balance resources, time and system complexity. And as practice shows with all the trade-offs, the Murphy's law works. Anything that can go wrong, will go wrong. So we somehow understand the problem and how we got there. Here are some common solutions. I often heard things like, let's hire more people, less overtime, or let's just buy more powerful hardware. And I think that is quite a superficial way to solve the issue. Hiring more people increases the amount of communication. Fred Brooks formulated it a long time ago. What one programmer can do in one month two programmers can do in two months. Then over times, like the law of diminishing returns generally holds here. Uh, the more you work, the less productive you are, and even worse, it often leads to burns out. Then better hardware, maybe, but it's better to know why exactly you need it and if it will work in the long run. Uh, all these practices may work short term, but all of them will likely to have some negative consequences if applied blindly. But uh, a good thing is we tend to formalize testing processes. It gives us our pressure, precious structure. But people are incredibly good in forgetting things and we are still limited by our imagination. Nowadays, there are many tools that can automatically generate schemas or documentation from the application code or vice versa. It surely removes a lot of headaches, but often it doesn't work well. For example, uh, the fast API framework doesn't always generate valid open API schemas and so on. There are many cases of that. And there, there could be a more effective solution. It's better to start from the design stage. So we try to prevent some issues uh, in the first place. We need to reduce the cost because our time is the most valuable resource and we need to automate as much as possible, which is somehow connected to costs. In my opinion, uh, the most important principle in API design is uh, to make it hard to misuse. And here are some examples where we can prevent problems. Let's take a look at the one of the most popular serialization formats, YAML. Here is a list of countries. But when we try to deserialize it, we might get not what we expected. It also applies to strings like yes, no, null, and so on. Um, to solve this, we need to escape strings, and then it's parsed correctly. And then maybe, maybe we can just use more reliable formats like JSON. At least we will know that there was no transmission errors and we don't work with a partially written schema. Uh, we can also prevent typos. Here we uh, have a schema that accepts 
accepts an object with the success key and expectedly this value passes. But success without the last letter will also work and it's not what we might expect. So to solve this, we can add a list of required fields here. Or in, in this case, like uh, everything will work as expected. No type of one pass will addition. Or alternatively, we can restrict additional properties and this key will remain optional. So by balancing strictness and flexibility, you can prevent some erroneous inputs. Another source of problem is regular expressions. Do you remember the Cloudflare outage from um, 2019? It was caused by certain kinds of regular expressions that are very resource intensive. Uh, for example, this regular expression uh, took about one and a half minute on my machine, and I bet that a string of 50 letters won't be able to won't be processed in any reasonable time at all. So please pay extra attention to regular expressions and uh, if possible, use alternatives way to express your API constraints or use regular expressions engines that guarantees linear complexity. So uh, now let's take a look at how do we test things. Um, for example, we can check that the commutative property of addition works. With the example-based approach, we can write something like this in Python. It does a function that accepts two arguments and verifies the property, and we have our test cases with PyTest. So we write them manually. Um, of course, it's super straightforward. Uh, but again, we can test only for things that we can think of, and often many edge cases are missed. In the end, we need to maintain all these manual version test cases, which also adds some maintenance costs. There is a different approach that looks at data and generates test cases instead. Uh, the most popular library for project-based testing in Python is Hypothesis. In this example, we test, uh, we reuse the test function and add some data generation strategies from hypothesis and define our numbers as integers or floats and connect them with the test function arguments. So the run might look like this. So running this uh, quickly reminds us that the commutative property for addition works only on real numbers and something that we might not expect initially. Uh, and with property-based testing, you will have a high variety of input data, which is, in many cases, can be inferred from input types. There is, uh, then there is test case magnification called shrinking. You will have a minimal example instead. Also, uh, often it expands your understanding of how your code actually works by showing you many, many corner cases. But generally, it requires some guidance. You need to define your data generation strategies, unless it uh, can't be automatically inferred. These two approaches work perfectly together. Use them both. And getting back to the API testing topic. Actually, there are a lot of properties we can use for property-based testing. For example, we expect that our API won't crash. There will be no unhandled errors. Then in general case, we expect that um, the input uh, should match the schema and it should be accepted and errors should be rejected in general. Of course, there are some uh, general limitations to it. Then we expect that uh, responses match with their definitions and all examples are working and so on. There could be much more of them, including expected response time or uh, authorization on certain endpoints and so on. So some time ago, I started working on a tool that combines API schemas with property-based testing. It's called schema thesis. And here's how it works on a toy example. Let's say you can create a user and need to pass a name as a payload. So something like that. Then schema thesis takes the API schema and creates hypothesis strategies for all API operations defined using the schema. It makes requests to the API and verifies responses. So it supports um, three different schemas. It supports um, OpenAPI, 
2 and 3. And also we support GraphQL. And generally, you need only a valid API schema to make it work. But actually, like not necessarily valid. Here is some statistic on that. There is a project called OpenAPI Directory, which is a collection of various API schemas. And at the time of writing, um, they had 3,225 OpenAPI schemas, which are mostly syntactically and semantically valid in terms of individual keywords. Um, some of these schemas are incomplete, though. Uh, they contain references to other files that do not exist. But schematizers can process the most of them, including semantically invalid or incomplete schemas. So if, it, uh, if the issue does not affect the data generation, we can work, no problem. And in terms of API operations, schematizers works on more than 97%. Uh, the rest goes to some cases of recursive schemas, some page cases, I would say, uh, logically unsatisfiable ones, where you just can't uh, find a fitted example, fitting in example, also to non-Python regular expressions and some similar issues. But there is a room for improvement for sure. Um, let's see how tests look like. Here I will show you a small Python test that utilizes our PyTest integration. You can load your API schema from the network file or dictionary or any readable buffer. Then this test will exercise all endpoints with built-in checks. Schematics has five built-in checks at the moment. They cover server crashes and API schema confirms, but you can easily write your own. Um, running this example uh, will show you, you can run it this by test. It will show you in case of error that there is a failing operation here, host users, and it can report multiple, multiple failures per operation so here's an error message, response payload, and a Python snippet that will help you to reproduce the failure. Soon it will be possible to have a curl command instead. Optional. So these are unit tests. They are usually very fast to, to run. They are pretty easy to customize. You can use regular PyTest fixtures, hypothesis strategies, your uh, regular Python things. Um, they are pretty easy to integrate with the rest for the same reason. And schematizers will also test ex explicit examples defined in your schema. Maybe if you use thread, we will do the same thing. But also we will um, fill uh, empty places in these uh, explicit examples. So you don't have to uh, write them completely. So here is an example of um, of uh, payload that um, that test generates on the previous slide. Or if you don't want to write any Python code, you can use our command line interface. This command will run unit tests for all available operations in the given schema. There is also a Docker container for your convenience and a lot of uh, command line uh, options to tune the behavior. And Squintis also can generate sequences of API calls. Let's extend our example API. So we create the user and we get an ID back. Then you can get information about this user by passing this ID as a path parameter to another operation. And you get some information back. Schema thesis uh, utilizes a very cool open API feature called open API links. Here you can specify how different operations are connected. Let's say uh, when you get a 201 response on user creation, then you have a link to another operation called get user. And you need to pass the user ID parameters there, uh, which you extract from the response body by using um, JSON pointer syntax. And basically you extract the uh, ID key value. So schematizers will automatically generate API calls like this. If we try to create a user, it will take, uh, if it's successful, then it will take the ID and will call connected operations. There are more, uh, the more connections you have, the more different random sequences of API calls will be generated. We use all dependent calls in place. For example, if you have a connected update operation, then 
created user might be updated before the get call or vice versa. And there are like all combinations possible. Uh, let's take a look at how we can write a test with our Python API. This implementation is based on uh, hypothesis state machines that describe that describe all possible transitions within the schema. Let's say you already loaded your schema as with uh, the code from the previous example. Then you need to create a state machine first uh, and expose a test class, which is a regular unit test test class. Then you run it with PyTest, and in case of errors, you'll see a report like this. Error message, response payload, stuff like that. And additionally, there will be a Python snippet that you can basically copy-paste to reproduce the failure. Usually, it's pretty verbose depending upon your API complexity, but you should be able to run it as is. So, um, integration tests. They are slower because they utilize features like swarm testing, uh, that is laughably effective in finding bugs. It exchanges some performance to higher uh, found defects rate. You'll need to specify connections uh, with the open API link syntax in your schema, or you can do it programmatically uh, in your tests. There is an API for that in schema thesis. Um, but it may uncover bugs uh, much deeper in your application that statistically are almost impossible to find without this approach. So why you might think about using schema uh, If you want to pay less efforts for finding bugs, the simplest way to use it is to run a short CLI command. It may find a lot of complex problems and edge cases. For example, schema knows how to maximize arbitrary metrics like response time or response size, uh, thanks to hypothesis targeted testing. And it allows you to find denial of service attack and amplification attacks. So also you'll have a great diversity of generated examples that will cover a lot of valid and invalid uh, test cases specified in your API schemas. I will tell you about invalid cases in a bit, but generally you can easily generate custom data like CSV files and, and so on. Uh, there are five built-in checks, as I said. Um, they allow you, allows you to check the API schema for compliance with the implementation. For example, auth status codes, response schemas, request, required headers, content types, and, and so on. Um, here we have a pretty flexible data generation. You can use any existing hypothesis strategy and tune individual request components like body, query, headers, and so on. You can specify your explicit examples partially. Schematizes will fill the gaps. Uh, there is a command line interface. You can record your tests and rerun them later with VCR style cassettes. For Python users, you can, uh, it's possible to, to test ASGI and WSGI apps directly without hitting the network. Um, there are a few features in progress. At the moment, I'm working uh, on negative testing. It will be possible to exercise negative testing scenarios or you can create, you, it will be possible to automatically generate XML uh, or binary formats like uh, images and so on. Uh, and at the moment, I'm involved in academic research about web API fuzzing, fuzzing in uh, collaboration with Zach Hetfieldos, who is a uh, hypothesis core developer. And the main question that we want to uh, answer is uh, whether this is effective at all. Uh, and the short answer is yes, but actually the longer version is that it depends on many factors, including schema complexity, how precisely uh, it defines inputs, and so on. We are still running our experiments and evaluating the results. The test suite includes around 20 open source projects and eight different tools, including uh, recently open source Microsoft's uh, Wrestler project. These results are in progress and cover only a subset of what we planned. This part represents only schema thesis, uh, which works in all, on all tested services in a reasonable amount of time and hardware resources. So, so far we tested 18 services and there, is around, there are around uh, 1,000 API operations, of which we crashed around 20%. These projects are pretty popular, I would say. And 
found various non-conformance issues on around 30%. Some of the crashes are caused by the same application code pass, as well as some non-conformance issues are caused by the same uh, schema components. And deduplication and categorization is in progress. These issues have different severity, of course, but they all become more visible with schematizes, and it's up to project maintainers on how to handle them. But anyway, I plan to report them in, in the future and open source the uh, test stand itself. Um, so here's a little glimpse of what will happen next. Um, maybe we will port hypothesis to Rust. Uh, I'd like to say that generally speaking, hypothesis handles general case outstandingly well, but for complex data structures like complex API schemas, there are some limitations. Um, there's already some work going on. Uh, we have a core engine that is written in Rust, but it's used only in the hypothesis for Ruby version. But the long-term plan is to make it usable for the Python version as well. And then it will benefit the whole ecosystem. Also, I'm building schematizes as a service uh, where you will have dynamic recommendations on approving your schema. It's much faster. Uh, we have we will have uh, automatic links inference, so you don't have to use uh, open API links. Uh, there will be testing, API callbacks, reports, schedules, and usual things for seamless CI integration. So to summarize, uh, keep in mind that a good API is hard to misuse in the first place, that you can prevent many problems upfront by designing them right. Uh, Property-based testing is effective for finding defects in web applications. And try out schema thesis, let me know what you think. And please consider supporting our work. Contributions and donations are welcome. Here are some links. You can find schema thesis on GitHub. Feel free to write me an email or ping me on Twitter. Here's my handle and schema thesis as a service will be available here. It's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, Dimitri. That was, that was an excellent talk uh, on, on an important topic. Uh, we had one question in the Q&A, which was uh, from Kasai, and I apologize if I mispronounced that. So is this only for pi testing of Python apps? I know one other person put a, put a comment in there, but I'd like to hear your, your view in the two minutes we have left. Definitely not. Uh, you can use it with any application because um, basically the uh, schema thesis is written in Python, at least partially, but it works over the network. So you, you can run a Docker image with schema thesis and put your uh, API location as an input. And it doesn't matter uh, in what language your API is written in. So and you mentioned a, uh, a container. So that if yes. people that are not Python programmers, yeah. then yeah. that's an easy way for them to onboard and, yeah. and use schema thesis? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Also, um, you can use uh, Microsoft um, Ra uh, Raft, I believe it's called. Um, it combines multiple different tools and it, it includes schema thesis and they use uh, our Docker images directly. So, uh, yeah. Okay, 